Sampath Massimo, it's wonderful to have you here with us in the Asia Pacific region. Sampath, I'll start with you. As you've traveled around the region this week, speaking with many of our enterprise customers, invariably the topic of the pandemic has come up. We've talked a lot with them about their response to it and how they've adopted new technologies and new ways of working to adjust to the new normal. What have those customers tell you about those changes here in the Asia Pac region? Yeah, Rob, you know, the biggest change we see is on digital. Mm. And digital has two components to it. Digitizing interfaces within the company, process flows within the company, mm. and digitizing customer interfaces, either customer acquisition or customer servicing mm -hmm. models. A lot of companies have used this opportunity to fundamentally change their operating model using digital as a way. Mm. These companies are winners. On the other hand, you have created this whole pool of companies that have been distracted during the pandemic, either for financial reasons or otherwise that have mm. just not done that. So you're going to see a separation of winners and losers largely driven by the pandemic. Mm. And I want to pick up on that, uh, Massimo, this idea of winners and losers as organizations emerge from the pandemic. You've seen customers not only here in the Asia Pacific region, but all around the world react and respond to these changes. What does a winner look like? What sort of technologies are they using to get ahead? Well, we clearly see winners and losers uh, with the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And the winners were the company who first and better than others uh, has built uh, a flexible platform for their applications. Mm -hmm. They build the ability to scale up and down uh, their application, their data, their ability to reach consumers mm. uh, and partners uh, and supply and suppliers uh, in one end to end streams. Mm. Those are the companies who really took advantage uh, of the pandemic mm. as uh, the users shift uh, from uh, in store uh, to online uh, purchase, for example, in the retail source. Mm. Companies who were far ahead uh, took advantage of that uh, mm. and expanded their business. And what role is cloud and hyperscalers? playing in that transformation for those winners? Well, it's a critical role because if you think uh, companies uh, have used to run their application in their data centers mm. uh, and to scale, they had to have more servers, uh, sometimes build new data centers. Moving to the cloud uh, gave the opportunity to scale. But there's one critical factor, the network. Mm. Once you put your application and your data in the cloud, uh, you gotta have a network uh, to access those applications. Mm. Uh, otherwise, you have a big constraint. Mm. And that was a missing piece uh, from some companies. Absolutely. And with that big change, capital models are changing dramatically as well. And Sampath, I know you've had many conversations in the Asia Pacific region with customers about the role that technology is playing in the fourth industrial revolution. What are they telling you about the technologies that they see playing a part in that, and how is it changing their capital models, particularly in the manufacturing sector? There is no cloud without the network. Mm. You cannot access the cloud, you cannot get to the cloud without the network. That's kind of the foundation of it. But as the fourth industrial revolution, there are two major pieces that have changed as part of the pandemic. The first is supply chain. We at Verizon used to have products, we used to have a three, four week lead time. We now have a 54 week lead time for those products. Mm. I suspect our customers are seeing the same. So the whole concept of just-in-time inventory has gone out of the window. Mm -hmm. So we are investing a lot and seeing our customers invest a lot in tracking assets, tracking inventory flows, using AI and automation, predictive models to do that. So that's mm -hmm. been a big piece of uh, the changes we've seen. The second has been on factory floor automation. Mm -hmm. uh, most companies and most countries uh, are trying to increase productivity. And even large Asian countries, you see a shortage of skilled staff. Mm -hmm. So they're going to have to add more automation and robotics. To do that, you just need a 5G network, a private 5G network to stitch all that together. Mm. And this is the foundation of the fourth industrial revolution we see, which is full-time visibility in the real-time enterprise across your inventory, mm. and then second, massive automation and robotics on the factory floor. Absolutely, and as you would have seen, uh, manufacturing is a significant economic output for the Asia Pacific region. And so there's a really important role for these new technologies to play to continue to drive economic prosperity right here with many of our customers. But it's not just manufacturing that is being impacted by these new technologies. Massimo, you've worked with some of the world's largest retailers and helped them to transform their business models, their customer engagement models as well. What can, what can retailers in the Asia Pacific region learn and take away from some of your experiences with these large global operators? 
You know, the game with retailer is to better profile their customers, to understand better their customers, and to get to the personalized sales. Mm. That's, that's a secret. To do that, you have to have a lot of information from your customers, and you have to uh, create the real-time insights so that you can reach your customers where they are in their thinking process and mm -hmm. their buying process. Mm. Once again, real-time opportunities and real-time technologies will make a difference on how good you are to get your customers where they are in the buying cycle. Mm. And of course, the face of retail has changed forever due to the pandemic. And you, as you made reference, not only in-store, but a blend of in-store and online retail experiences. What trends and technologies are our customers in the retail space using to help create that omni-channel experience? Well, a lot is uh, is uh, is uh, you know real time uh, real time interaction uh, is the ability to create in the store a similar experience than you have online. Mm -hmm. If you think online, you can quickly search a lot of information. In the store, sometimes you have to look at the product, to read, and all of the stuff. Uh, so creating the presence, physical presence that you have in the store, but mm -hmm. providing the same level of information, the same simplicity to buy that you have online mm -hmm. is one of the secrets. Mm. And again, once uh, how do you do that? You profile the customer. You give them the information on their smartphone mm -hmm. uh, as they get into the store. Uh, you give them information on the product on the shelf right on, the, on, on, on your smartphone. Mm -hmm. You make it easy for people mm. to figure what they could buy and what they're buying. Absolutely. And so with these changes in business models, the adoption of these new technologies, we're seeing an explosion in data, uh, particularly here in, in the Asia Pacific region, where many of the economies have been a mobile first economic model to begin with. With any explosion in data comes increased complexity and therefore risk. We've seen an explosion in cybersecurity threats and opportunities for cybercrime to flourish in the last two years. Sampath, starting with you. What are the key trends in the cybersecurity space? What have you seen as emerging threats? What should organizations here be thinking about to better protect themselves? Yeah, look, the cyber is not a new thing, but what we are seeing is the pandemic has opened up new vectors of attack. The biggest one we see is social engineering mm -hmm. phishing. It used to be a small portion, now it's a pretty large portion mm -hmm. of attack. But the key theme on cyber is, everyone thinks cyber is James Bond type stuff. Mm. It's state <laughs> actors you know, doing things more than almost 90% of all cyber attacks are run by organized crime syndicates. Mm -hmm. And why? Because that's where the money is. Mm. It's a pretty simple thing. They're doing it for profit. It's a pretty easy environment for them to make money. And with crypto, you can't trace and track mm -hmm. the money as well. Mm -hmm. So one, people do it for money primarily. The second thing is almost eight out of 10 attacks that happen are happen because there's a lapse in hygiene. What mm. does a lax in hygiene mean? A port was left open, a patch was not updated, mm. a password was called password one, two, three. Very basic things. Mm. You don't need to do really high-end stuff. You can get almost eight out of 10, nine out of 10 of attacks solved by just getting basic hygiene in place. Mm. The third one is work with trusted partners. There's an interesting thing about cyber. There are companies propping up every day. It's one of the most invested fields by venture capitalists globally in the world. You as a company cannot keep adding 20, 30, 40 different partners. A large company today works with 25 different partners on cyber mm. and yet they feel unfulfilled. Mm. So one of the things is work with large trusted providers who go scan the market, give you what the best is and add their own secret sauce and integration. And this is a little bit where Verizon comes in. Verizon has probably one of the largest cybersecurity businesses in mm. the world largely driven by this. Yeah. We see a third of the world's internet traffic flow through our networks. We see good actors, we see bad actors, <laughs> but we see them first. And that gives us a very inter interesting vantage point mm. in our cyber business. And creates great value that we can deliver back to our customers as well. And Massimo, you know that in the Asia Pacific region, we have a very strong cybersecurity business and we serve many enterprise and government customers throughout the Asia Pacific region. What are they telling you about the differentiators, the value that Verizon cybersecurity services are bringing to them, helping them to secure their assets, to secure their data, to secure their partners? Well, first of all, Rob, you said it right. This is the number one region in security mm -hmm. in my organization. And uh, there are some distinctive elements. So number one uh, is, uh, as Sampat said, uh, our ability to see things uh, happening in the big internet uh, 
before others. Mm -hmm. We can recognize patterns which could lead to a breach before the breach happens. Mm -hmm. And that's the quality of the data and our ability to correlate data. But the other critical thing is uh, the skills of our people. We have people who have uh, lived in the security for 20 plus years. Mm -hmm. You have people who have been working uh, to support government agencies uh, and enterprise uh, for many, many years. And mm -hmm. so if you combine skills uh, with the data, then you have mm -hmm. a perfect combination that helps mm -hmm. our customers to be ahead of the hours. Mm -hmm. and, it, and security is a life, uh, is a life cycle. It's, it's, it's planning, it's uh, protecting, uh, giving access to information, but it's also reacting. Mm -hmm. the, the ability to know what to do when something happens uh, to minimize the impact uh, mm -hmm. on the company data and on the company brand mm -hmm. and react to that uh, in a timely manner. Absolutely, and Sampath, staying on security for a moment, we've talked a lot with government and policymakers here in the region about the skills deficit, the requirement to quickly train and skill up, particularly in the cyber security space, so that the industry as a whole can better prepare for the threats that are emerging. Talk a little bit about the lessons that we could learn in this region based on the work that we've done elsewhere in the world to develop skills and work in partnership to create a better cyber security posture. Yeah, Rob, one of the things you need is a public-private partnership to mm -hmm. do that. There is so much money being invested in cyber globally. You want countries to get access to all that investment mm -hmm. globally, which means access and partnerships with private companies to do that. Second, mm -hmm. you need a trusted partner in this game. Mm -hmm. You need, the governments need to work with trusted partners who can help do that. Third is, you know, allocating money to training is the easy part in my opinion. Mm -hmm. What's important is what are framework institutions you put in place to actually make that training happen mm -hmm. and then the feedback loop back from industry. And lastly, ensure that these folks get the right jobs. Mm -hmm. That's important, otherwise this is not worth much. And then the last, the, probably the last piece is, cyber is an interesting place where there's just a lot of diverse talent. Mm -hmm. So large companies and governments need to open up a little bit they need to think about talent differently. They need to think about career paths differently mm. to attract a very diverse set of talent who are very excited by working in cyber. Yeah, great. And, you know, we talk about that in the Asia Pacific context as a tight partnership between enterprise, government and service providers such as ourselves to make sure that we're all working towards a common, uh, safer future in the cybersecurity sector. Massimo, Verizon's commitment to the Asia Pacific region is strong and firm. We've been operating in the region for more than 30 years. Uh, we're one of the, the only global providers that still maintains infrastructure and network capability and asset in the Asia Pacific region, including Australia, Japan, and Singapore. But the face of networks is changing. The face of how customers want to consume networks is changing. Spend a moment talking about what enterprise customers are telling you about how they want to consume these network services in the future and what's our response to helping them uh, meet those requirements? Yeah, we see more and more um, customers uh, uh, willing to consume the network differently. They need to consume network differently because again, their applications are sitting now everywhere. Their data are m more and bigger than before mm -hmm. and they're sitting everywhere. So the network has to be a flexible platform, mm -hmm. similar to the cloud. Mm. So there's a concept of network as a service, which is the cloudization of a network. So customers want to consume network in a flexible manner. They want to pay for what they use, and they want to use what they need when they need it. Mm. That's why we came up with this framework of network as a service, which is basically a, a programmable network platform where customer can uh, decide uh, what they want, when they want it, mm -hmm. and we adjust uh, the network. We program the network uh, to respond to the, to the needs uh, of the application and to the needs uh, of the customer. Mm -hmm. That's a new concept that we developed two years ago, and the customers are really responding well mm. all over the places. And the, and the other differentiating element is that we do that globally. Mm -hmm. We're not just sitting in one region. Mm. We can build this platform globally in Europe, in Asia, in US, in South America. We are everywhere. Think of uh, this uh, operating platform uh, which sustain uh, the business of a customer. Mm -hmm. That's what Network as a Service is. It really is a very revolutionary way to think about network and infrastructure, particularly for large global enterprises. And uh, we've seen firsthand how excited customers are about the promise of that new architecture and that new service design, Network as a yeah. Service. I love the quote you used, the cloudification of the network. It's an easy way to imagine and think about that change. Final question for both of you, starting with you, Sam Path. 
casting forward into the future a little bit. We've talked about a lot of different technologies today. Uh, some of them are exploding in the Asia Pacific region like 5G adoption, cloud technologies and increasingly cybersecurity. Cast your mind forward five years from now. What does the technology environment look like? What differences are enterprise and government customers thinking about when they're planning today for whatever that future state looks like? That's a great question. The one I think is the most important is how 5G gets used. Mm -hmm. 5G today is what the internet was in 1996. Close your eyes, think what the internet was in 1996 and all the changes that happened with mm. it. 5G is that moment today right now. It can fundamentally change your operating model, it can change your cost position, it can change productivity, it can change the way you reach customers, but it's going to require a fair amount of work to develop those use cases. Mm -hmm. We have the basic platform, the basic building blocks are all in place, in production, the technology works. Companies need to have to adapt that for their businesses, for their verticals. So I think that's probably the biggest technology change we're mm -hmm. going to see. The second one is going to be automation. Automation everywhere, in the factory floor, in customer experiences, and the biggest thread stitching automation, of course, is AI, because you mm -hmm. need those capabilities, but you also need a network. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you, six out of 10 of these large cloud projects mm -hmm. fail because their networks were not in place. I mean, that's a crazy number. Sitting in 2022, if someone tells me six out of 10 cloud mm -hmm. projects don't meet deadlines and fail mm -hmm. is because of network is not a good answer. So we got to start working with large enterprises to get the network functionality at the foundation mm -hmm. before they get excited about digital and the technologies on top of that. Thanks, Sampath. Slightly different inflection for you, Massimo. Five years from now, Sampath just talked about 5G. We're already a leader in fixed wireless access and new ways to create on-ramps into the global network and global architecture. What are some of the network trends that you're seeing five years from now? Uh, well, it's... Um the, the, the network uh, will be an integral part uh, of a mm -hmm. business transformation of our customer business. Mm -hmm. And I'm talking about customer business. I mean, just today we met a couple of customers uh, and they were sharing with us uh, the vision of their business, the vision on how technology could transform the business in construction, in retail, mm -hmm. in healthcare. And they were not talking necessarily about the network because the network was part of it. Mm -hmm. the, the, the network is an integral part of it. It's just one continuum from the network to the application mm -hmm. and to the security. So the encouraging news is that customers are projecting their future. They're talking mm -hmm. about business. They're talking about how they transform the way they build mm -hmm. a new building, the, the, the way they build a city, the, the way they manage mm -hmm. the, uh, uh, the new buildings. And it's everything, it's all together. Mm. So the network will be transforming uh, the way customers do business and it will be an integral part of a new business process. Yeah, one continuum. I think that's a great way to describe what, what the future of integrated technology and connectivity looks like. Yeah. Thank you. Sampath Massimo, thank you very much for joining me here today. It's been a great pleasure speaking with you about emerging technology trends in the Asia Pacific region. Thank you, Rob. Thank you, very excited to be here. Thank you. <laughs>